Y'all planning for this? Welcome back, TPR Nation. This is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer, and we are going to be talking today about just filling up space with words that don't even matter and how we avoid that in a situation talking with our clients and talking with our team members. And if you're a financial advisor out there listening and you're thinking to yourself, okay, you know, I've got all these meetings scheduled with clients and we're going to go do these reviews. Maybe you've implemented Surge. Maybe you haven't implemented surge, but you've got something structured in your office. Either you're meeting with your clients annually on an as needed basis. So you're constantly being reactive. Anytime that they have a question, you're picking up the phone. Hell, they might even have your cell phone number and you're trying to be that concierge level financial advisor, which by the way, does them very little service and creates a situation where you are always on and always have to be prepared for every single phone call that comes your way. Maybe you're still following a quarterly format and you're meeting with your clients on a quarterly routine basis and that's worked really well. Maybe it's semi-annual and it's twice a year you're checking in, checking out with them. We follow Surge at Chelansky and Associates, our RIA up in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, Some in the financial advisory industry will even credit us with starting Surge in the beginning, but we often laugh and say that God alone must have created Surge because he did everything in time blocked periods, included incorporating his rest day on Sunday. So when we do Surge, we are hyper-focused and hyper deliberate. And if you're not familiar with what surge is, oh my gosh, I'm about to blow your mind. So surge is a time blocked period in which you are hyper focused on doing nothing but meeting with your clients. And this isn't just for the solo practitioners. This is for everyone. Even if you're in an enterprise office, your whole office is buzzing with the energy of surge and being super focused on providing as much value as possible to clients. We started this off doing a two month surge Uh, that got really, really long with us. We want to see if we can sharpen that skill just because about six weeks in we kind of hit a plateau our team got a little bit winded we wanted to see what we could do about that. So what we've done is we've done a four-week surge. Uh, some of the advisors in our office are at a six-week surge still, and that depends on their meeting cadence. We have rules set in place with financial advisors. So a lot of the times uh, for us Shalanskis, and that's Floyd Shalansky, Jamie Shalansky, Micah Shalansky, we can meet with a client and wrap that meeting up in, in an hour. In an hour, we can change lives. A lot of times the meetings, especially if they're virtual or telephone, can be done in 30 minutes. And then when we're meeting with our team members and vendors, we can get a lot accomplished in 15 minutes. So we're really deliberate about our time and we know that it's not infinite. So we give it a lot of focus and a lot of attention to create as much value as possible without rushing through things. And so during our surge period, it is common that Shalanskis will meet from with seven to nine different clients in a day. But in order to do that, your meeting has to have a religious cadence to it. You have to be what I was just teaching a young junior in our office, you got to be the maestro of that room. All of the instruments have to be harmonized, but you are holding time. You are responsible for the suspension and the elongation and the shortening of time and brevity and what needs more space. Because what we don't want to occur is we don't want our clients coming to the end of an hour and feeling like they were rushed through a topic. We can get a lot accomplished in an hour and not strip away our humanity in talking to people and realizing that they are trusting us with their life savings. These are individuals that have hired you for guidance with their life savings. These are heartbeats. These are people that we want to impact and we can systematize all day long as long as we are keeping those heartbeats at the forefront of our conversation, our policies, our processes, and everything that we do at Shalansky and Associates. It is critical. It is always always about the heartbeats. And so when people are coming into our office and we work with a myriad of ages, so we've got retirees, we've got pre-retirees, we've got mid-career, and we've even got some amazing clients that are just starting out their careers. And you want to talk about doing some fun financial planning. When you can get a young professional at the very beginning of their career and they want advice, they're willing to take it, they're willing to pay for it, and they're going to listen to you. Oh, 
my goodness. Then you get 10 years down the line and they've they've gotten married and they've had kids and you've helped them negotiate contracts and they're earning more money than they ever earned before. And it's just amazing, beautiful experience. You don't always get with pre-retirees because pre-retirees, their decisions are made and you get to help them through the next chapter of their life, which is even more uh, amazing because retirement is emotional. I, I mean, there's a financial equation to that, but that's just math, right? That is just math. Retirement is about so much more than that. Uh, Floyd and I, we had a joint meeting and a prospect came in uh, to our office and it was an interesting conversation. And this is one of the things that my team will joke with you. Uh, and I will say, well, which word did you use? And then they'll, they'll laugh in the background and say words matter because I'm constantly telling them your words matter. What you say has weight. And I want to know if you're using the right terminology because it has a specific impact. And if you think about that whole maestro metaphor, right? If I need strings and percussions comes in instead, that's going to change the entire, entire musical experience. So making sure that we are using those right words and we're not just filling up space for the sake of filling up space becomes critical to this beautiful performance that is a client meeting. So how do we do that? How do we implement Surge and talk to our clients, especially if you are coming off of, and we've been around, our parents started, uh, Floyd and Rosa Shalansky, they started Shalansky and Associates back in the 1980s. So we've been around a hot minute. And when we uh, started the business, uh, it was set up on a quarterly routine. Now, my father's a very forward thinker. And right out of the gate, he started charging financial planning fees in addition to the asset under management fees. And the reason he did that was that he wanted to show the rest of the financial planning so much more attention. Because a lot of times, and I hate that this is true, but it is so true, we focus on where we make our money. And so if we're making our money on the investment, what gets all of our focus? The investments. And instead of really diving into the financial planning and going through the insurance and going through the estate planning and going through cash flow and going through long-term care and doing all these things, we have one brief conversation with a client about it. And if there's no product to sell, we check mark the box and we move on that we talk to them about it. We think that is a travesty in the industry. And this is not true of everyone. You might be like us who are out there saying, saying, no, 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 no. When I meet with my clients, we really, really segregate these different financial planning topics and we comprehensively and thoroughly go through them. Long-term care is one that often gets missed because if you're not selling a long-term care policy, you might just have a brief conversation with a client that says, hey, what are your long-term care decisions? And we tell every client, one of the great words, and this is words matter, right? Use this, please. We tell every single client, regardless of their age, you don't necessarily have to have long-term care insurance. It may or may not be right for you, but you must have a long-term care plan. What is your plan if one of you loses the ability to work during your working years? What is the plan if one of you predeceases the other? How are we going to help if you guys have disease or injury that makes it into a point where you got to make some life decisions? So we always talk to clients about having that long-term care plan. And that's a great segue to get them start thinking. And because we operate surge, every single one of our surges, we're talking about the value add that we are going to be delivering during that particular surge. And a value add is a step up. It is one more thing, one more layer of value that we deliver to the clients that makes incredible sense for them, for them specifically. Because at the end of the day, people want to know, prospects want to know, clients want to know, team members want to know how does the information you are giving me impact me? impact me and my family. When clients start talking to you about the markets and they say, hey, how are the markets doing? It's been a tough year. Oh my gosh, the markets are just soaring away. They're doing so great. What is the real underlying thought that they're thinking? How am I doing? How am I doing? How is my portfolio holding up? Am I weathering the storm? Am I taking advantage of the opportunities that are out there? They want to know when it comes to market performance, what is their plan? What is their impact? 
with everything that's going on and all the sensationalism that the media is constantly selling us day in and day out. We just wrapped up a meeting with our entire investment uh, team. Uh, so in Shalansky and Associates, we have an investment committee that gets together and they decide on our models and our portfolio of what's going to happen. And then the rest of us on the financial advisor spectrum, they get together and they have a meeting and they go through, hey, this is what's going on. This is the outlook. This is the historical performance. This is what we're thinking. And this is an internal conversation only, right? This is not a client facing conversation, but this is something that internally we go through and we also say, hey, what are the questions that clients are asking us the most right now? Because we want to get a pulse point. And a lot of, you know, the questions, it can be time to what's happening in the news, regrettably. So we just went through the debt ceiling. You know, if the, if the debt, if the U.S. Def- defaults on the debt, what are we going to do? Never mind the dozens and dozens of times the U.S. has come very, very close to hitting the debt ceiling since the 1970s. I saw one statistical report by a government agency, and I think it was like 68 times or something since the 1970s that, that the U.S. has almost hit the debt ceiling. It was something atrocious like that, right? Well, before the debt ceiling, what was the big concern? You know, um, as we went through COVID, COVID erased any tensions we ever had with China, right? And forget about trade wars. Who's even talking about those today? So we're constantly sold things inside of the news that tempers our, our outlook on what portfolio performance should be like. And so we want to make sure as a firm that we're all coming together as the financial advisors and we're talking about those topics that clients are most concerned about. And we take every question just as the client asked it. And then we get to the heart of it, right? And we talk about symptoms or disease. And so the clients are talking to us about the symptoms, but what's the underlying condition? What are they really trying to treat? And how can we, in as few words as possible, specifically answer their questions? And then we make sure we're all on the same page. And what I absolutely love about the way that they, we do things at Shalansky and Associates is it's this incredible team that is dynamic and collaborative and says, hey, listen, I'm having a hard time phrasing it this way, or I don't know how to question when a client asks us. And for financial advisors, this is a brand new concept because so many times throughout history, our egos have always been the forefront of any room that we've entered, right? Our egos enter that room before we ever do. And we're so afraid to raise our hand and ask questions around our peers and other advisors for the fear that we don't know or we're going to look stupid. And so instead, we don't ask questions. We don't collaborate. But at Shalansky and Associates, we encourage and insist on this level of collaboration. Because guess what? Not a single one of us is omnipotent and everyone has something to bring to the table. Everyone has something worth contributing. And if you don't, you get to learn from the other people that want to share that space and they want to give you a hand up, not a hand out. They want to help you make sure that you're strengthening your relationships with the clients and that you are delivering massive value so that you can go impact as many heartbeats as possible. So our chief investment officer holds this meeting and he says, hey, listen, we're going to go through all the PE ratios. We're going to go through all these different models and, and technicalities that clients, you don't even want to get into a conversation with clients about, right? Because you don't want to. So many times when we want to show people our expertise, we try to make them look stupid instead of providing value to them. And that's something we're real cognizant of at Shalansky and Associates. So we don't go into those type of technicalities. We answer the questions that clients have the most meaning around. And that is, do I have enough money to retire? I don't want to outlive my retirement income. And how does this volatility impact me specifically? And for us in our office, we tie that right back to our cash flow. Cash flow is king. Cash makes us make decisions. And so whether or not we have enough money, whether or not we think we're comfortable enough to retire, how much money we can take out of our portfolio, all of those conversations come down to one simple truth. We don't want to outlive our income. We don't. We don't want to outlive our income. We can really empathize with clients about that because we get it. We don't want to outlive our income either. We don't want to have to go back to work in our 80s. We don't want to have to go live in with our kids because we didn't do an adequate job saving for retirement. And so for answering that specific question for clients, and we're always getting back to the heart and the root of that, we can help them make educated decisions. And so we tie that right back in our office to our value add based on our buckets report. Now, for a long time, there's been a great rivalry between Matthew Jarvis and Micah Shalansky about buckets and guardrails report. Both are substantial 
substantially beneficial. And honestly, I don't know how they work if they don't work in harmony. Like if you're presenting one report, you're immediately going to be searching for that next report. So we've done a beautiful job of streamlining that and bringing both of those reports together so that we can answer two specific questions that clients have. And that is how much money can I take out of my portfolio to fill my gap? So the retirement income gap is how we help clients identify between their retirement income sources. Maybe that's a pension, maybe it's social security, uh, whatever those retirement income sources are. And then how much do you actually need in retirement? How much money do you need? So for example, and this is just conversational here, let's say that clients are spending $10,000 a month and maybe they've got a military pension, they've got some VA disability, and then they went and worked for the federal government. So they've got all of these different retirement income sources in addition to potential social security. And so once we pull all of those sources together, it looks like they get about $8,000 a month from retirement income sources. Well, if they're getting eight and they need 10 on a net basis, what do we know that they're going to have to draw from their portfolio? We got to fill the gap. So the very first thing that we talk to clients about when we're looking at this is what is your retirement income gap? And that using that word, just that simple, simple monosyllabic word gap helps people quickly go, yep, okay, I got to bridge this. Now, now there's, there's a space in between and we immediately identify that retirement income gap and that helps them put in perspective what they need to draw from their portfolio. So a lot of times they might think that they need a lot more from their portfolio than what they do. Or second of all, they might think that they need a lot less and that the savings that they have is enough. And we got to have a guided discovery that that might not be the case. So once we've identified this gap, now we can start talking to them about decisions on the retirement accounts. Now we've quantified how much money that they're going to need from their portfolio. And the second way that Floyd leads into this conversation is we tell clients, we say, hey, listen, the first couple of years that you retire, those are your go-go years. You have worked long and hard for this retirement. So that first 36 months, we know that you are going to go go, go. Those are your go, go retirement years. And mind you, be specific. Listen to how I said that. Your go, go retirement years, right? These are not polysyllabic words. These are monosyllabic. I'm not talking down, but I'm being relatable to a wider audience. These are your go, go years. And that means once you retire and you're no longer having to go to work Monday through Friday and every single day becomes a Saturday and Sunday, how are you going to be behave? What are you going to do? Mr. and Mrs. Client, let me ask you a question. Right now you're working a full-time job Monday through Friday. When do you spend the most amount of money? Is it Monday through Friday that you go to the store after work? Or is it maybe Saturday and Sunday when you have time to go to dinner and you have time to go see a show and you have time to get together for their birthday parties? And of course, the client's like, oh, definitely. We definitely spend the most money, um, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of those fun things on Saturday and Sunday. And then we ask this, Mr. and Mrs. Client, what happens when every single day is a Saturday and Sunday? And then all of a sudden it starts clicking for them that they're not going to be in those accumulation stages anymore. They're going to be in those distribution stages. And that is a significant mind shift for retirees because all of a sudden their entire life, they've worked and saved, worked and saved, worked and saved. If they wanted something such as a new car or a new toy or send the kids to college or go on holidays, they've always been able to work and save for those goals. But what happens when we flip that switch and it's no longer about working and saving, now it's about distributing from savings. It's a big mental shift. And so we talk to them about that retirement income gap and that we also identify that they've worked long and hard for this. So it is kind of going to look like a bell curve. You're going to go into retirement scripting and saving because you know that your, your income's about to be shut off. And then you're going to get really excited to be retired and no one is busier than a retiree. In fact, the joke, Mr. and Mrs. Client, is that six months after you retire, you're going to come in our office and say, you don't even know how you had time to work in the first place because you're so busy. And that's beautiful. The busier you stay during the retirement years, the greater life longevity that you're going to have. 
But here's what we know about those go-go years is that it's going to act like a bell curve and you want to go, 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 go. And then we got to start plateauing off. We got to start coming down a little bit and being a little bit more deliberate and intentional with our retirement savings. So we know those first three years of your retirement, you're going to spend more money than you normally do. But then after that, we need to have a conversation and make sure that we're aligned on our goals because your retirement savings is finite at that point almost. And you're not going to be accumulating and going back to work. Is that correct? And they're like, no, I do not want to go back to work. Okay, great. Then we need to make sure that we're living within our means. And then that's when we bring out the guardrails report. And we talk about the distribution schedules and the rates and what the portfolio performance has to be and what your portfolio has to maintain in order for you to pull out X amount of distribution and fill that retirement income gap. Now, the way that clients sabotage their retirement plans is if they make too frequently one-time distributions that were unplanned for. That's how we start eroding principal. That's how we start jeopardizing our retirement savings. And that means later in life, you're going to have to scrimp and save and tighten up those belts in ways that you might not be comfortable with doing so. So let's prevent that from happening. And once we've identified that retirement income gap, their next question, almost simultaneously as if scripted is where does that money come from? So then we talk about the buckets and we aggregate all the household accounts together, exclusion of like 529 plans and educational savings accounts and those kind of things. But we aggregate the household savings because we don't oftentimes look as a household as yours and mine. Uh, We kind of want to know that, but we want to look at that as a household and we want to reinforce those values that this is household money as well. And so we'll take all of the different accounts and we'll aggregate them on the um, um, together and then we'll divide them out in the buckets. And the buckets will be defined as what do I need in cash? What money should not be in the market? Now, we are of the belief that money that you're going to need to use in the next three to five years does not belong invested in the market. This is cash. This is money market. This might be a CD kind of contingent inside of there, but it is something super liquid and that we want to just keep rolling and keep really, really safe. Um, And so the way that we look at that and explain it to the clients is we say, listen, you know, over uh, what we can't do is we can't predict market downfall. What we know is markets are going to go up and markets are going to go down. But when they've gone down historically and we'll pull out the JP Morgan timeline, and this is a great tool to have inside of your conference room when you're meeting with clients because it helps put this volatility in perspective. In fact, think about this. Uh, One time I was going on a girl trip and uh, had a whole bunch of us girlfriends on the airplane. And just in front of me was uh, one of my friends and she's, you know, screwing around on her cell phone and she goes to the, she has an Apple phone. So she goes to like the stock performance, right? And so she turns around, she's wearing sunglasses on the airplane because we're also drinking quite a bit. And uh, she pulls down her shades and she looks at me and says, Hey Jay, look at what the markets are doing. And it's just bloodbath, right? It's just red everywhere. And she's like, Oh my gosh, do you need to like, as soon as we land, start calling people? And I was like, like, no, why would I call people about the markets being down like that? She's like, well, isn't this bad? And I take her phone and the Apple defaults to showing you the markets on a one day basis. So it's like minute by minute. And I expand it by five years. And she goes, oh, well, that's not bad. And I was like, no, question what's being fed to you. So if we are all having this type of media in our face, that's asking us to be impulsive with the information that we're getting because it's constantly barraging us all of the time to make impulsive decisions, we have to push back and put it in a longer perspective. So this JP Morgan timeline helps us do that. And it says, okay, listen, here, here we start with a, you know, a great depression and it went all the way. It didn't uh, incorporate COVID just yet. There might be an updated one. If there is great uh, Uh, print that one down and use it. But it goes all the way through the great financial crisis and how long it took markets to kind of settle. And so we talk about the three years that we had back to back um, during that global financial crisis. And we said, listen, if you had needed to make a distribution, a substantial distribution from your account during those times, you would have been pulling money out during a down market. But by following this strategy, by implementing these bucket scenarios, you've got adequate cash to make these distributions. And so we explain it to them and we say, listen, we can't 
tell you when those markets are going to go down. But what we do know is historically, they have not been down more than three years in a row. So by having three to five years of cash available, not invest in the market, you don't have to pop Dramamine every single day of your retirement because you're so dizzy by the up and down roller coaster that the markets tell you that we are on. And all of a sudden, clients really like that. They start nodding, they start acquiescing, and it puts it in perspective. And so think about a lot of the verbiage that I'm using here today. We're having a conversation. When we call clients, we don't say it's time to schedule your meeting. We say, hey, Floyd, Micah, Jamie, Christian, JT, Sierra, whoever the financial advisor is in the office, uh, wants to get together and visit with you. Do you have time on July blank blank at such and such? Now they know it's a meeting. We know it's a meeting, but we say visit. We want you to come in and we want to have a conversation. We want to talk with you about what's going on in your life. And the focus of what our meeting is going to be on is centered around whatever that value add is that we are going to be delivering to clients during our surge period. And we talk about this as a team ahead of time. One of the things that I'm really, really meticulous about with our team is if you want to implement a value add in your office and watch it fail, have your team implement it without doing it themselves for them. So for example, if I've got a team member that has not sat down and physically filled out and and shown for themselves the value add and how it works for their particular household, it's going to fail. Your team members are going to offer you incredible insight about what you're missing, what bugs need to be fixed, uh, what's working, what's not working. It's, It's a powerful, powerful tool for them. So in our office, anytime we do a value add, so for example, on the net worth report, we ran the net worth report last year. It was a smashing success. And, um, it wasn't your typical net worth report. It's still it's still going to show you your assets and your liabilities to get you that bottom number. But we took that bottom number and we moved it to the top of the form. And we moved it to the top of the form like it was a score, like they had been playing ski ball and they were ratcheting up points up there. And what we loved about doing this is what, and it was an unintended consequence, um, is that clients started pointing out the assets we didn't have information on because they wanted that number to be bigger. So they'd say, oh, yeah, by the way, I still have this CompuShare certificates for my first employer. Oh, by the way, I've been having, you know, I've been purchasing gold periodically. Oh, by the way, I have a stack of CDs or bonds or whatever it is. And so we had all this unintended consequences by just making sure that net worth report was something that meant something to the client. And so we were able to go out and issue that. But before doing so, our entire team, and I think it was last year, that we did it. Our entire team during this time of year, we all sat down and we all had to fill out with our spouses that net worth report. Now you don't have to share it if you don't want to, but you know what it did? It opened our eyes to things that we forgot about. So for example, I forgot about adding student loans. I work with a lot of doctors and it just fell off my radar to add student loan information inside of there. And luckily it was one of our employees that still had a student loan that said, hey, I didn't know where to put this. And I was like, oh my goodness, yes, of course I should have a line specifically for that, right? Because we don't just have a blank area for your assets and a blank area for liabilities. We help clients understand what those assets are, right? Assets like your primary residence, assets like cash in hand, assets like your investment accounts. Um, And then what are your liabilities and how do we account for all of those? And so because we have those uh, sections, of course, we have an area for other, but we have those sections. It allows clients to more adequately fill out this form because they're not intimidated and they're also not forgetting the information. So this was a super, super powerful tool. But what we did was just that one little maneuver. We just took that bottom number and we put it at the top right next to their name and said, your net worth for your family is. And that was smashing. I can't even tell you how great of a success it was because that number meant something to those people. It was their financial scorecard and they wanted to see that number get bigger and bigger and bigger. Another area that I'm really cognizant of, and this comes from uh, reading a lot of Russell Branson. He wrote Dot .com, a fantastic book. He's a great entrepreneur, uh, but he says that he has his greatest success ratios when he writes emails, sales scripts, funnels, web pages, etc at a fifth grade level, nothing bigger than a fifth grade level. And I think he even said like a third to fifth grade level, but, but right around there, right? So we don't want to talk down to people. That's not what this is. 
It's not talking down to people. It's not making people feel stupid, but it is an abandonment of industry jargon. It is deciding deliberately trying not to alienate your client by using a bunch of jargon that only makes sense to you and your peers. Instead, we're using words that make sense to the client. Retirement income gap. What bucket of money is this going to come from? This is your go-go period. It's okay to spend a little bit more money here, but then your retirement needs to be like a bell curve. If we are truly on a mission to impact as many heartbeats as possible, and that is what this is about, that is what makes financial planning so profound. There are three F's in your life. There's fitness, there's faith, and there's finance. You can only outsource one of those. One of those, your fitness, nobody's going to do those setups for you. Nobody's going to make better health decisions for you. You have to make those. Your faith, that is between you and God. And you have to get yourself centered and you have to get immersed in your spirituality in order to make a meaningful impact and to have your life mean something. And then there's finance. Finance is something glorious because you do get to outsource that. You do get to hire a financial advisor. And that financial advisor and their team, you listening to this podcast, you are empowered to go and make meaningful impacts on as many heartbeats as you can reach. But the best way to do that, the only way to be impactful for those individuals is to cut right through all the noise and get to the heart of the matter. TPR Nation, you know that here we are 100% about actionable advice you can take right Right now and go and do something about. So what I want to challenge you today is a lot of times people sit around, and they think, oh, I need to rebrand. Oh, I need to do all this. No, what if you're already doing great things? Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't throw everything out. What do they say? Don't throw the baby out for the bathwater. You know, you need to sit back instead and say, what do you have that's working? What do you have that's not working? And something that is working, maybe you just need to implement that third or fifth grade level. Uh, there are two Two apps out there that will help you. Um, I think Hemingway is the one that does it the best. So if you just go to Google and you type in Hemingway writing tool, most of the version is free. I think there's a paid one that you can get that's pretty nominal. I think it's like 20 bucks a year. It's not very much. But when you type in your words, it will tell you what reading level you are writing at. And if you're writing at a collegiate level and that's not your audience, if you're not targeting professors, then you need to probably take a different approach and use less words and more impact. So look at your branding, look at your client deliverables. How are you really answering their question without all the industry jargon? If there's jargon, highlight it on your form. Investment returns, portfolio, analysis, risk, all of these different words that mean something to industry professionals, but they don't really translate to a client. They clients don't really understand what you're talking about any more than I would if I was hanging out in the back of the house of a hospital and they were all throwing around medical terms. So what does it mean to the client? What words have the most impact? So first thing that you're going to do, you're going to go to Hemingway and put all of your sales material through it and see where you're writing at and what choices you can make. Now, when I said go put everything, get one thing accomplished. Sometimes we bite off a lot more than we can chew and we don't get anything actually done that we can use. So instead, put one thing in there. Maybe it's a personal financial fact finder. Maybe it's your buckets report. Maybe it's this one page plan that you're using. What are you using that you can throw inside of Hemingway and say, all right, what level am I writing at? And am I answering the client's question? And so the second action item for you to take is to look at all of those pieces and say, and highlight all of the jargon. Where do you're using jargon and what could be replaced instead? Now, this isn't your disclosures that compliance are telling you that you have to have, but where is some jargon that you could probably do without and make more of an impact? And then third, what are clients really asking you? Maybe you have a niche. Maybe you have an expertise. Maybe you are focused on one particular group of people. And if that's the case, what is the heart of their question? What are they really asking you? And how can you answer that? Because if clients come in and I'm just 
just picking on the markets, right? But if they come in and they say, you know, I'm really worried about the markets. Uh, they're, you know, so volatile right now. I think it's going to be another down year. What are they really asking you? Do they care about the global economy at large and scale? Or do they do they really want to know how is this going to impact their investments? Do they need to make different decisions? Is this going to jeopardize their retirement? Will they have to work longer? Will they have to cut things out of their spending? And get to the heart of the questions because it is 100% about the heartbeats. And if you begin and end with those people in mind, my God, the impact that you are going to have. TPR Nation, this is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. Go find people who share your values and change the world. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. The information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. The perfect RIA.